Welcome back to the Bitcoin Layer. I'm Nick Batia, and today we have Michael Goldstein, also known as Bitstein. Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Michael, you are the author of a new Substack called the Bitstein Brief. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your Bitcoin journey for those that aren't as familiar? Uh, you're one of the first people that I found as a resource in the Bitcoin space in 2016. So tell people about your Bitcoin journey and then uh, in please introduce your new Substack publication as well. Yeah, well, uh, it's... it's uh... I guess it all, all it all fits together um, and comes full circle because um, basically this all started in high school many years ago now um, when the financial crisis was happening. Uh, I realized that I knew nothing about economics, and when I reached out to someone to learn about economics, I was uh, lucky enough to find someone who um, did not send me a Paul Samuelson or uh, Paul Krugman text. Um, but instead Rothbard and Mises and uh, the Austrian school. Um, and so I became very obsessed with Austrian economics um, throughout high school and college. And um, in 20, 2012 or so, I started a reading group called the, the Mises Circle at the University of Texas, where we'd get together and you know discuss random Austrian texts um, on on. A whole variety of topics and within that group eventually we got uh very into bitcoin um you know later later on and this this was still it didn't feel like the early years then but now it uh it apparently is the early years so um we got into bitcoin and we were some of the first i think to be um doing a an Austrian analysis of Bitcoin. Um, we weren't the actual first. There, there were many that came before us, but we were we were some of the ones really propagating um, these ideas online um, before they were um, as popular as they are today. And we were just trying to think. You know, we we had a particular view of how money worked, and Bitcoin happened to fit perfectly into that. And so we were very excited about the possibilities, um, both on the intellectual front about just you know the truths of of how money works um was sort of being best demonstrated um by bitcoin and through an explanation of bitcoin and also strategically um a a path to monetary reform was much more uh likely impossible with bitcoin um rather than trying to imagine going back to some kind of gold standard um and so we became very very excited about that um, later on, I started the Nakamoto Institute, which is uh, a website dedicated to the history and economics of Bitcoin, um, focused around uh, Satoshi and the cypherpunks and our own um, analysis that had uh, originated at the Misi Circle. And, um, you know, that's just been kind of a, a website I've, I've had maintained um, since 2013 or 2014. And um, recently, you know, in the past few years, uh, especially after the publication of the Bitcoin Standard, uh, the uh, the Austrian school has become a lot more um, popular among Bitcoiners, and many people who, you know, I I was someone who got into the Austrian school and then came into Bitcoin, uh, but most people were not like that. Instead, they came to Bitcoin for uh, either they were interested in the technology, they were interested in speculating, um, whatever it may have been, they got pulled in and they see all these people talking about um, Austrian economics and they're interested in what did you guys know that you were able to you know, comprehend this thing? You know, how, how did you get here so early? How did you make sense of it so early? Um, uh, and uh, because of that increasing interest, um, I I did not do uh, a lot of writing over the years. Um, I was mostly doing publishing of other people's works, and I did have a few, uh, you know, notable essays. People people like my essay "Everyone's a Scammer" um, from 2013, but uh, I, I wasn't writing as much. And with this growing popularity of Bitcoin and the growing popularity of trying to understand big. Bitcoin through an Austrian lens, I thought it was time that I um, got more serious about putting my ideas out there um, and being able to help people, um, 
help Bitcoiners better understand Austrian economics and hopefully also um, the other way around um, and try to get to the heart of you know, um, economic theory as it relates to Bitcoin um, so that we can understand this, this thing that's happening all around us. And you mentioned the Bitcoin standard. Um, and I think one of the reasons that the Bitcoin standard is so popular is because Saifedean introduced very broad or widely this idea of time preference and how it fits into the Bitcoin thesis and how it applies to our current monetary system. And it's something that I heard you talk about before the Bitcoin standard was published as well. This idea of the collective morality of our species and how it has evolved on fiat. So can you talk, Michael, about your sense of um, your sense of morality on f a world on fiat versus what it could be on Bitcoin. I think this is something that we at the Bitcoin layer don't talk about too much. We're more focused on Bitcoin and global macro. We don't get often into the philosophy, but you're a perfect person to touch on this. Yeah, so it's a it's a very big question. So I hope I can um, help paint some good brush strokes. Um, but yeah, so, you know, uh, uh, Seyfedean was also, obviously, he is he is a product of uh, the Austrian school. Um, and him and I have been, you know, friends for many years and, you know, discussed a lot of these uh, ideas. And time preference is one of those things you, you hear a little bit about it from other, you know, economic traditions. It's not a completely foreign topic. But I think the Austrians are unique in their um, focus on the time dimension in economics. So for instance, there's recognition that um, capital, when we think about capital, you don't think about just a large homogenous thing called capital where it just has, you know, inputs and outputs and it just spits out things. Instead, capital is this very dynamic thing. Um, you know, it's, it's very, very uh, heterogeneous. You know, when you develop a structure of production, and the market conditions change, you can't just magically snap your fingers and turn a paper factory into a car factory or vice versa. It takes um, time and effort and resources and all that to be able to uh, divert resources that were previously used towards one line of production into um, a different line of production. And so this informs a lot of um, ideas on you know, kind of, uh, you know, economic policy in general and, and how we should think about um, things from entrepreneurship to just, you know, how how markets respond to things. And, um, and another important thing to bring in is the fact that the, the Austrian school is very much focused on individual action and understanding these sort of um, macro events, not as an uh, aggregate per se of individuals um, in a in a sort of like I said just homogenous unit of of society, but instead it's this um, bottom up emergent uh, uh, order built on individuals acting. You know, it's it, society is made of individuals making all sorts of choices. So with all this being said, so uh, for those who might not be interested. Uh, uh, knowledgeable about you know what is time preference it's basically the the ability to um or not not necessarily the ability but the the willingness to defer grat uh, 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 gratification so or, or delay gratification so basically the the austrian position is that you know any individual would prefer a good that they want uh, now rather than later. It's it's almost like a, it feels tautological when you say it, which is, is true of a lot of um, economic statements. But basically, people would rather have things now than later. Um, but the reason that you wait till later is because if you, instead of consuming resources now, you put them towards a different use, then in the future, you can have even more goods. So how this comes together with money is that, you know, uh, underneath this all, in order to have things, <laughs> you have to actually have saved up 
resources that you can put them to use. Either you consume them or you can invest them in you know, various uh, lines of production and so on and so forth. Um, and let's see, like when you are not able to have good savings, um, you don't necessarily, you're not going to be able to um, plan as well into the future. And so you're going to have more of a desire to want to consume things now and just, uh, you know, enjoy what you have because you don't know what tomorrow um, will we'll have in store for you. And you have no way to, not, not only do you not have a way um, uh, to, to know what's in store, but you also have no way to sort of calculate against that. So where this all fits into Bitcoin is because Bitcoin offers um, much more certainty in its properties, we know how many units there are. We know, um, we know, you know, that everything is valid. We know all the transactions and blocks uh, are valid. We know that it has good durability and transportability and all these things that we know that if you have Bitcoin, you have extreme certainty that when it comes time to use that for whatever it is that you want to use it for, you'll have it. And so this becomes, uh, you know, people, people choose these things as money. Um, and as that permeates a, an, an economy as um, the, the sort of unit of account and, and all of that, people can start doing economic, economic calculation using Bitcoin. And because they're so certain of it, they can have a much uh, longer time horizon that they're thinking on when they're making economic decisions. On the other hand, when we look at the, the sort of counter example, the fiat system that we're under, when, you're, when you have a dollar bill, and you know, also with uh, quite extreme certainty, to be honest, uh, that the value of that is going to be going down. In fact, you're 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 simply uncertain of like how fast it's going to go down, but you know it's going to go down. You're going to want to um, get rid of it as fast as you can. Um, so people, people we, we see this in a variety of ways. People start investing in more consumer goods now. Um, people uh, start making investments that they might not otherwise make because they need a quick return now to beat inflation rather than a, you know, long-term source of uh, cash flow or, you know, uh, some, some other, you know, sort of long-term economic benefit. So in a fiat system, uh, people, people are much more short-term oriented um, because they constantly have to beat out inflation. And where morality comes into this is, um, I would say not necessarily in the sense of uh, that we can necessarily sit here and from economic terms come up with like an objective morality per se. Um, in fact, I would, I would preface or, or make a caveat to all of this that like low and high time preference, that itself is not even a... Um, moral claim. Um, some people have reasons to have a lower time preference on one thing and a higher time preference on another thing. And it doesn't necessarily have to do with them being a good or bad person. Um, I think the, the main point is that people um, in a fiat system do not have to bear the costs of their choices as much. And so they do not take as seriously the uh, consequences of their choices. So it's almost like a, a meta morality argument, I would say. Yeah, it's a great car- clarification in terms of the the time preference being um, a, a matter of consumption and not necessarily morality. And that consumption habits also to not tie that explicitly to morality, but just relegate it to consumption, that this is the type of consumption that might happen under this system and this is the type of consumption that would happen under a much lower time preference system where people aren't battling inflation. So I want to bring up one thing you mentioned, which is it's something that we really have to, um, we really have to realize as Bitcoiners here, which is that in the current fiat system with embedded inflation as part of the goal of the system itself, to keep it alive, that regular people have to also be investors 
just to keep up with inflation, they have to they have to have an additional skill set in addition to the skill set uh, which they can derive income from. Just to preserve that income, they have to have an additional skill set either as an investor or give their money to somebody that they trust in you know in this world where it's very hard to know who to trust with your money and oftentimes your money uh, disappears if you leave it with a trusted third party so it does bring back and this is something you've written about too the idea that bitcoin allows us to go away from this system where we rely on this whole investment complex can you speak to that yeah well i mean i think you i think you nailed it so um you know, I, I always love Michael Saylor talking about this because he kind of just brings the engineering mindset. So he he introduces this idea of like, you know, inflation being a vector. You know, it's not just one number that um, applies to the whole economy. It's this it's this vector. And you start to just think in terms of, you know, a percentage just being drained every single year um, from uh, savings that you have. And so you if if inflation were as low as 2%, which we know it's not. I mean, I, I don't know what the current numbers are that they're putting out, but it's, you know, it, it, around 9%. And that's that's lowballing it because it's government numbers, which of course we uh, can't trust. And that means that every year, any dollar that you're holding onto is losing 10% of its purchasing power right now. And that means that in order to get more you have to you have to make up for that 10% along the way but your work that you just do on a regular basis you're probably not you know making that kind of productivity gain year over year as well because you just you, you know you're you're a normal person you're not necessarily um making grand technological advancements um you know the, that that takes time so because of that people find themselves more and more underwater as inflation continues on, especially as it gets into these um, more uh, fragile uh, situations, which I would argue is kind of a, a natural consequence of engaging in inflationary policy at all. But yeah, people have to find new ways of making up for that. So, you know, maybe you take on an extra job or, you know, you start speculating on stocks because uh, asset inflation, you know, the, the asset price increases, that's where a lot of this new money goes. Because, you know, when, when new money is printed, the reason they print it is not because they want to sit on more dollars. It's because they want to go get some resource for themselves. So they actually, you know, they that, that new money gravitates, you know, often towards uh, these kinds of harder assets than, than the dollar itself. You know, so so you can get your hands on on equities that won't print as fast as U.S. dollars will print. So people people start to do that themselves, and thanks to things like Robinhood, um, you know, we could say that's that's good or bad. I think, uh, in a sense, bad just because people should just do Bitcoin. Um, but people also are now able to play that game as well, um, and it's kind of a sad fact that people are forced into this situation. Their hands are forced. Um, and I, I don't think it's a coincidence that we live in this age of, um, you know, ev everything's like a productivity blog. You go on Twitter and every other account is, you know, giving you productivity tips. And there's like this grind set attitude um, where you should be working hard 24 seven so you can, you know, get rich and everything. And uh, from a moral point of view, this is uh, this is me, you know, speaking my own, you know, view of the world and. I, I don't think that's a good way to live. Um, and in fact, if you're having to grind all the time, um, which when you really, my sense of it is people, they just want money. Um, they'll come up with all kinds of other things. It's like, oh yeah, well, I'm in, I'm in the, you know, the market helping people because I'm, you know, selling these courses and stuff, or you know, I'm, I'm starting a Substack. Uh, <laughs> we, we all have to uh, engage in this, right? Um, it, a, a lot of it you know, tends towards just people are trying to make money and, uh, people, people need that because you, you have, you have to get ahead. And from a sort of moral perspective, if people are 
in the grind set so much, um, then that necessarily means that they have less time in their day to engage in uh, contemplative activities or recreational activities or time with their family or all of these other things that I think, you know, when, when we're on our deathbed, uh, we think back and think, wow, I wish I had spent more time with my family. I wish I had, you know, done X, Y, and Z. All of those things are being deferred because people have a more, um, uh, you know, insatiable need for money now um, instead of instead of uh, these other things. Because if you if you were to just focus on your family right now, um, you might not be able to stay ahead of inflation, and then you won't be able to feed your family. Um, so I think, you know, when, when you're not able to just put things into savings, um, it makes it much more harder to just live whatever that moral life might be that, uh, some, wh how, however, any particular person, um, defines it. And, you know, for me, I tend to think that a person, um, we have a division of labor for a reason. It's because when, when everyone specializes in, in some, uh, task, uh, some some job, you can produce more wealth that way. And we have an incredible coordination tool to power the division of labor called money. And when you have the best money and it allows people to have the best coordinated division of labor, it means that people can go do their job, whatever it might be. Um, they can get good at it, do their nine to five, get the paycheck, spend less than they earn, put the rest away into savings for later. And then they can go on and do um, you know, other things with their time um, that would suit them. Like I said, like contemplative activities or recreation, family, um, you name it. So um, I think that kind of trade-off that um, we're seeing a lot of people facing, it's 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 very tragic. Um, and, you know, I, I hope that we can get out of it. I, I don't like having to grind as much as I do. Um, I'd rather be doing those things. And it's interesting how you present the grind set as part of the core issue when, my question was about, you know, people having to face this inflation and then outpace it. So the grind is to outpace. And if you actually are spending, let's just say, per your example, more time with your family or in leisure activities, that you actually expose yourself to the risk of falling behind. And we know with compounding being one of the most powerful forces in nature with inflation compounding, the longer that you're not outpacing inflation, the farther behind you fall. And that is a tragic consequence of the system that we live in. And so maybe you can talk about, you, you know, you said the natural consequences of inflationary policy. How do we explain to the world, what these natural consequences of inflationary policy are in a way that they can understand. So you're, you know, you're doing your part by writing a new research publication on Austrian economics, and I'm doing my part about, you know, trying to educate people about Bitcoin, but what more can we do as, you know, you and me, and maybe our audience to make more people understand the natural consequences of inflationary policy, which is the de facto policy of every government and central bank around the world. <laughs> what more to, I mean, there's, there's always more to do, I suppose. Um, the, the work is never done, but, uh, yeah, I mean, education has, has been my, my biggest one. Um, you know, I, in life, you can always you can you can learn the easy way by learning from other people who already know uh, what they're talking about, or you can learn the hard way by uh, just you know sticking your hand on a hot stove. Unfortunately, a lot of people uh, kind of prefer that. So um, a, a lot of this, you know, I've I've been ranting about inflation. It doesn't matter how much education I do. Um, people didn't take inflation seriously until they saw uh, grocery store prices and gas prices not going up by, you know, 2% or whatever, but by going up, you know, 20% in a year. And so, um, and, and by the time you've done that, it's, it's too late. Like that, that is because things have already happened. Um, and, and, you know, that's an important thing that people have to understand. So um, 
for me, uh, you know, education is clearly an important part because as these things happen to people, you know, they start to ask questions. And I think that we should be there um, to answer those questions, much in the same way that, you know, when the financial crisis happened, um, you know, I was I was a young guy and I didn't know what half this stuff meant. And so I had to ask questions. What is what is all this stuff that people were getting upset about? And someone was there for me to, to teach me that. Um, so I think in the same way, um, it's about, you know, preparing to be able to answer questions that people will inevitably have. Um, and for those who do want to step ahead of the curve, uh, the answers will be there for them ahead of time as well. Um, the other side of it is, um, you know, simply stacking sets and doing your part by, um, you know, hodling more and adding to the reserve demand of Bitcoin, which increases its value for, you know, everyone involved and to uh, give, you know, do do Bitcoin development and all of that. Um, that also, you know, just creates a better money that people uh, naturally turn to. Um, you know, I, I ultimately don't think of like my education uh, efforts as the reason that Bitcoin happens. Uh, I think that Bitcoin happens and my educational efforts are um, just a one way to help explain why that may have happened. What are some of the topics you're looking forward to writing about, uh, maybe either within Austrian economics or Bitcoin more broadly? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I've, you know, <laughs> there's a lot. Um, one of the things that I've, I've come to realize because of the fact that, uh, you know, people are getting interested in it again, I realize like how much sort of, uh, Austrian knowledge there is that I take for granted, um, but haven't been, you know, people don't know about. And so as far as like the range of topics, it's going to be a lot of everything. I'm obviously especially interested in the theory of money. Um, more so, you know, I I don't really, <laughs> I'm, I'm on the other end of the spectrum from you with regards to like, I, I don't look at macro trends as much. I mean, I'll, I'll comment on it uh, occasionally, but it's not something that I, I consider myself some kind of expert on, you know, uh, what's going to happen because of this particular Fed hike or something like that. Um, to me, I'm more interested in getting to the fundamentals of what makes a good money and why that's Bitcoin. Um, so, uh, you know, my my overriding assumption, it, not really an assumption, it's it's because of, uh, uh, you know, having having thought through, but the the overriding theme is that bitcoin is that you know kind of best money and i want to describe all of the different ways why um and a lot of the topics um it's sort of reactionary in a way in the sense that uh you you pick up topics based on where you see other people maybe not quite understanding something um, and so that that's usually a good sign of this is something that needs to be written down because clearly um, there's there's still a fallacy that you know Bitcoin is volatile and so it's not good or um, you know oh it's just a speculative speculative asset therefore it's it's you know there's no actual use underneath these are all things that it's like that that is a sign to me that oh I should write about that and. Okay, for this next question, instead of asking you a question, I'm just going to say one word and then uh, I'll let you respond to it. Tell me whatever your thought, the first thoughts are that come into your mind. Gold bug. Uh, I was once one. <laughs> so, tell, so and, and I'm there with you. I was someone who found Austrian economics and the concept of gold as a money year, actually years before... Um, discovering Bitcoin, I would say five, six years before discovering Bitcoin truly. So what, what do you think about today's gold bug that is, let's say, let's just even give him or her credit. And let's say that he or she is open to Bitcoin as a digital version of gold, open to the fact may even have a small allocation in their portfolio may include Bitcoin in some of the sentences that they write about 
gold being, you know, something that they're promoting or, or advocate the ownership of, but people that are still on this idea of gold being the, the way forward for our monetary system, or even, um, even if it, they don't believe that we should go back to a gold standard, people that think like there's popular research out there right now that is saying that Russia and China are building a pseudo gold backed currency, and this is going to, you know, break the dollar and all that. So can you just respond? What are your thoughts about gold's role in tomorrow's monetary system? So, you know, to, to preface, you know, I, I said I was once one and I was, I was a hardcore, you know, advocate of returning to the gold standard. And I, all of, all of my Bitcoin ideas, most of them are pre Bitcoin. Um, and what I did was I went in and replaced gold with Bitcoin. Um, and then understanding the, you know, engineering and technological advancements of Bitcoin more and more, um, it becomes more than just a replacement. It's like, no, this this is literally, you know, a orders of magnitude uh, better. Um, so the, the gulf there widens. But the actual, like, core, you know, what I call, you know, monetary maximalism or, you know, whatever you might call it with regards to a lot of the... Um, Bitcoin maximalist type arguments that I make, I had those same ideas about gold, uh, uh, gold before I even knew about Bitcoin. And Bitcoin only strengthens the argument. And that brings us to the other stuff, which is I just don't think that uh, I I think th there's there's a few things going on here. For one, gold is literally just not as good of a money. Um, for, for all the reasons that, uh, you know, Sa SAFE wrote about um, in the Bitcoin standard about, you know, how, how costly it is to move gold and settle gold, how costly it is to verify gold um, and how costly it is to secure it and all, all this stuff. Like it's it's just it's a very messy system. It, it also, you know, there, there's 2% more gold every year. Um, r roughly speaking, so the the in, there there is that inflationary tendency. Um, it's just, and thankfully, this is why you know, uh, you know, thankfully so. This is why gold bugs like gold is because there are, are natural forces that keep that mining in check. Uh, but with Bitcoin, we just have you know, uh, it, it just a an all around better. Uh, form of money. I, I recently wrote an article for the Bitcoin Times called "Toward a New uh, Node World Order," and um, in that, uh, if, if people would like to read it, I, I go through a lot of the, you know, ways in which um, Bitcoin creates more certainty than gold does across the board, and why it's just fundamentally a better money. So there's that side of it. Um, then there's sort of the strategic side of it. And this has its own things. For one, you know, boomers are going away, um, and I actually, I actually like the boomers more than um, uh, most people in my generation do. I, I think that uh, you know, there's there there are good things to say about boomers. That's that's my controversial take for the day. But that being said, you're gonna have a hard time uh, getting a millennial to be interested in gold. Um, or or a Zoomer. Um, I don't I don't know about Gen Xers, but I assume you know I, I know a lot of Gen X uh, Bitcoiners as well. So it's just it's it. None of us have been alive in a world where gold had anything to do with our money, um, and we've we've been products of the full fiat system. When we're looking for something, we're also all digital natives. So the digital nature of Bitcoin and the historical nature of gold, um, they're not, it doesn't scare us off in the same way. So I think, you know, Bitcoin, it is literally superior. And the things that might scare older, you know, gold bugs about Bitcoin, like its digital nature, you know, it doesn't bother us. And I, I don't remember a time when gold was money. So like I can theoretically understand a return to that nature. But I'm literally presented with something that's better. And when you actually look at the market, 
gold and they think this is a good thing, you know, it just like holds steady, right? Um, you know, or generally speaking, it kind of holds steady and see it like it's a good store of value. But that's not what I want. Um, in fact, I, I, I want something that's growing. Um, and so, you know, you know, Bitcoin is actually growing in value and we see real inertia in uh, a forward direction. We see a lot of momentum. Um, we see a lot of acceleration. And so, yeah, I just, I, I don't really like share that uh, kind of boomer mentality of, you know, wanting, wanting that old thing because the old thing is not even as good as the new thing. Um, I don't know if there, there was more to it that I, I could get into. But no, that no, that's that's. I think that um, you know, understanding the differences between gold and Bitcoin is important, and the people that are expecting a more gold-linked monetary future, um, it might just be a generational gap, as you point out. There's Michael, also, what? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, well, ahead. I was also going to say, uh, I. I, I it came back to me that, uh, you know, one thing I notice about a lot of um, precious metals advocates is they tend to be hesitant to speak on whether the market would decide on, say, gold or silver. It's almost like, you know, we'll, we'll take what they'll give us. Um, and I also, you know, now that I've, you know, thought a lot about, uh, you know, the, the concept of stock to flow, and to be clear, the concept, not the uh, model, um, there is something to be said about supply growth and uh, non-monetary uses of a money and how that affects the, uh, call it like the capacity for moneyness of a good. And based on that, this is, you know, the basis of how um, Saifedean argues that gold effectively demonetized silver. And I think he makes a very convincing case. So if someone's unable to imagine why gold is not merely like, you know, an option next to silver, but literally a better one. Um, it might also be hard for them to understand why um, Bitcoin would not just be, you know, among a basket of possible um, commodity monies, but the best commodity money. Um, and uh, understanding the reasons why that is, which I, th I think a lot of gold bugs have difficulty understanding these, um, you know, dematerialized aspects of Bitcoin and dematerialized aspects of money itself. Um, thinking, you know, back, you know, Austrian economics is is a is a, a field that uses subjective value theory and methodological individualism. That is like thinking from an in individual point of view. A lot of this, it's it's abstract in the first place, you know, and so. Um, the reason that we had physical gold as money is not be necessarily because physicality is a, you know, beneficial thing, but that was just the form that we had. And so you have to go back to first principles. And I don't think that a lot of the gold bugs um, are as equipped to really go back to first principles and think from a, from a hardcore subjectivist point of view, what is this thing money and how do we get the best of it? Um, because I think they would come to realize that Bitcoiners are thinking that way. And we've determined that the physicality just is not as interesting as they thought. In fact, it may even be a big detriment. Um, so, so those are additional things that I think hold uh, gold bugs back. That is a, it's a fascinating a thought experiment. And it just made me think about how gold bugs are also reluctant to acknowledge that in at least some part, the S&P 500 has demonetized gold over the past few decades post gold standard. It's something that um, I just don't think that uh, many people are talking about as much in the precious metals world. Michael, I want to ask you a, a, a few questions here before we get you out of here. Um, what does Bitcoin maximalism mean to you individually? What does that word mean and what does the idea of it mean to you? Yes. So, <laughs> you know, it's a it's a neb nebulous term because it was made as a pejorative against uh, effectively my way of thinking. Um, uh, and 
when I think about Bitcoin maximalism myself, um, the first and foremost is a belief that the universe tends towards a single monetary good. Um, you know, ceteris uh, uh, paribus, the universe would prefer a single monetary good um, because that way everyone in div the division of labor has has this single good that they can calculate against and coordinate with, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the second is the argument that of that monetary good and what we know about what uh, drives that tendency towards that you know, monetary unification, Bitcoin is the monetary good that I think is most likely um, to, I, I, I think it's most likely for the global economy to reorganize itself around next. Um, you know, and it, it does fundamentally have the capacity to displace the dollar, the euro, et cetera, as that unified coordinating mechanism. From that, <clears throat> sorry, um, that's sort of the descriptive argument of Bitcoin maximalism. And also that, so if you have a single monetary good, we can also then look at the sort of engineering properties of it or you know the actual properties the engineering of it and we can look at a an alternative cryptocurrency and say this is th this does not have what it takes to actually displace bitcoin for a variety of reasons um and if that is the case this gets into a sort of non-descriptive uh realm for some people i tend to you know have this attitude then that what i know about monetary competition and the belief that Bitcoin has what it takes to become that global monetary currency and that uh, when we when we look at all of the trade-offs and that of altcoins versus Bitcoin or gold versus Bitcoin or whatever, Bitcoin just outshines them for reasons that other people, you know, the supporters of those might not understand um, the way that just as an example, like someone might not understand why 10 minute block times. Um, it is arbitrary in the sense that Satoshi arbitrarily said it that way, but it's it's within that range of what it is for a reason, and that's why it stays that way. All these things um, that that make Bitcoin what it is. If you introduce a competitor, in a sense, it's a bit antisocial um, because you are fighting against what I have already presupposed as the best good. And so from that perspective, um, I, I default towards a skepticism towards any competing cryptocurrency um, or any currency at all. I mean, if, if Russia and China created a gold-backed currency, I would also have the same skepticism towards that. It doesn't just have to be you know Solana or something. Um, and that because of that, we should also have a more of a focus on Bitcoin only um, because you know we are individuals who have uh, limited time uh, to dedicate towards uh, towards these, these things. I don't want to spend all my day trading to try to, you know, kind of speculate on all of the different prices of these things. I want to make long-term plays. And so because of that, I, I remove distractions and uh, focus on Bitcoin uh, for all of those reasons. And that kind of, I think that summarizes the, like I said, the descriptive economics, uh, which is, is not a value judgment. You know, it's, it's not my fault that Bitcoin will win. Um, I'm just saying it as it is or as, as I believe it. Um, but then some of the more uh, normative statements of because of that fact, I think it's best for uh, me to have a focus on Bitcoin. Um, I think that it's important to educate others on why that's the case so that they don't um, make short-term decisions that can um, harm them in the future, um, although it's ultimately up to them to make those choices for themselves. And uh, what you mentioned, your, your engineering you know, background and bias, what was the engineering light bulb that went off for you when you were looking at Bitcoin in the early years? Because I think that a lot of people that are in Bitcoin, uh, maybe just from the long side, haven't done their full engineering deep dive or never have had that engineering light bulb 
which might make them, I guess, it might open them up to thinking that diversification within cryptocurrency is a better strategy than 100% Bitcoin maximalist allocation. So what is the light bulb that helped you understand that early on? Well, I think an important thing to say, at least with my own journey, is that for me, the technology is a means, not an end. So I am not in it for the, te the technology. I'm in it for the sound money, and the technology enables sound money. Um, so I think that's an important thing to say, because for me, the light bulb that went off for Bitcoin, like, like most people, when I first learned about Bitcoin, it, was, it, it seemed stupid. Um, I, you know, I watched like a crazy bubble happen and went really high and then crashed to pennies and stuff. And um, I, I actually referred to it as, as fiat because I thought that it was just, you know, you're just making it out of thin air and there's as much as you want. So for me, the engineering thing that was very interesting was coming to understand um, at, at the time, at just a very high level. I, I know better now about the, the lower level of how it actually does it, but the understanding how it credibly maintains that fixed supply and that fixed supply schedule um, was a real big um, light bulb for me because that's what that's what the whole of this theory of why Bitcoin is good rests on. If that wasn't there, it just wouldn't be as interesting of a project, um, probably not interesting at all. And so that was a key moment was realizing is like there is a fixed supply and here is a basic understanding of how um, that's maintained through like, you know, Coinbase is having, you know, a certain reward limitation, like there's a certain subsidy and how it calculates that block by block. Um, and I think otherwise, you know, it, it doesn't make as much sense today because there's way more competitors and they all kind of ape uh, the same technology. Um, but at the time, learning from a programming perspective how it worked um really solidified just the the beauty of the system and and its its elegance um but of course like you know if i just say oh go learn how how bitcoin transactions work um you'll get an appreciation for bitcoin but it doesn't that alone doesn't tell you why it's more interesting than some other cryptocurrency that uh also uses those same transactions. So for me, it's the credibility of the money supply that got me first in. And it's the thing that I think remains the most important and the key thing that anyone needs to understand. Um, so that that would be a good place uh, for people to look is just how how does the block reward work? And why is it the case that there's only 21 million Bitcoin? And why is it the case that it only... It, it it happens over an expected period of time. If you can answer those questions, you've already thrown yourself way down the rabbit hole. And I suspect that you're going to have an appreciation of Bitcoin that you did not have before. Thank you for that. And just to recap what Michael said for the audience, it's not the fact that there are only 21 million coins that will ever exist. It's how that supply schedule is maintained embedded within the network and the software um, and the rules that Satoshi wrote in the first place. And he used the word Coinbase, but he wasn't talking about the company, folks. He was talking about uh, the word Coinbase is used to describe the reward that goes to the winner of each Bitcoin block. Michael, it's, uh, yeah, go yes, ahead. Yes, it's specifically, the, it's, a, it's a special transaction that's set by the miner and it has a particular set of rules. And when you follow those rules, which is the only way to get your block accepted by the network, uh, you only, you, you're only allotted a certain maximum reward that you can give yourself. And um, the, the key word for a lot of this uh, that listeners should look up is the difficulty adjustment, which uh, if, if the Swedish Central Bank wanted to give uh, its, its Nobel Prize in economics to um, someone who does not destroy money, um, I, I would, you know, nominate Satoshi specifically for the difficulty adjustment, um, which is, I think is one of the, the greatest innovations in, um, monetary technology possibly of all time. Well, Michael, if you campaign long enough for it, Satoshi might eventually win that Nobel prize, uh, for the difficulty adjustment. So don't give up hope yet. 
Uh, last question for you, and then you can send us out with where to find you online and where to find your work and your new Substack that everyone should go subscribe to. Michael, give the audience a bear market pep talk as someone who has been through not one, not two, but three of these, if I'm correct, uh, in your experience. Just give the Bitcoin long position out there um, a pep talk for someone who's been through these bear markets a couple of times. Yeah, I, I've lost total uh, track. I don't even know how many bear markets I've been through now. Um, you get used to it. Uh, so that's that's the first thing is uh, you do get used to it. Um, but I think bear markets, you know, people like to say bear markets are for building. And I think that's totally true. I don't think that's just for people who are working on projects who suddenly actually get to focus on their projects because they're not looking at charts all day. Um, I think that's also for individuals building their own knowledge base of Bitcoin. And when we think about Bitcoin, we're necessarily thinking about the long term. In fact, you know, this is this is a project that it wasn't made so that, um, you know, 2011, we'd have perfect money. Uh, we're not there yet, clearly. Uh, you know, this is this is a project to create a a money that will last us an eternity. And so it's it's probably going to take some time. In the meantime, we can see all of the fun. We can, first of all, we can spend the time to learn the fundamentals, to understand why this thing is interesting in the first place. And as you learn about the fundamentals, you can look at those charts and you can see that despite what the naysayers might think, because they say, oh, look at this top, which happened to be like people getting overhyped. Despite that, in the long run, the fundamentals have been getting stronger. And we can see that. We can see how much better Bitcoin storage has gotten. You know, uh, back in the day, it was very difficult to store Bitcoin. Now we have uh, a million different uh, hardware wallets and, you know, other other methods of keeping your keys safe in a way that, you know, even, even the boomers can get. Um, and um, yeah, all, all the fundamentals are just getting stronger and stronger. Blocks continue to get mined. Um, and so I think that's uh, that that's the important thing to be focused on anyway. Um, so uh, and, and of course, when the price is lower, that means that your DCA gets you more sats. Um, so it is a it is a good reminder that we need to stay humble and stack sats and focus on the long run and focus on you know understanding why we're here in the first place. Um, and if, if you want to just get rich quick, you can go play all kinds of fiat games, but we're here for the long run. So, um, you know, enjoy it. Great. Thanks, Michael. And so tell everyone, uh, where they can find your new sub stack and where else we can follow you. Yeah. Uh, my sub stack is the Bitstein brief at bitstein.substack.com. Um, I'll, I'll have a lot more articles coming up uh, after the holiday season. Um, and you can also find me on Twitter at Bitstein. Um, my DMs are open if you have questions for me. Um, I, I try to get what, to what I can. I can't promise I get to every message. Um, I, uh, I also have the Satoshi Nakamoto Institute at nakamotoinstitute.org. And uh, episodes are rare, um, but uh, subscribe to the Noted Bitcoin podcast as well um, that I host with Pierre Richard. Um, we don't do episodes often, but uh, they do happen occasionally. So, and you never know what's, when, when they'll come out. So um, those are the best places to find me. Well, you guys had a great run in the 2016 to 2018 era. I was a big listener of the noted podcast so thank you for uh, for both of you for putting out those episodes over uh, the last few years and i would definitely recommend people go check out the nakamoto institute website it was somewhere where i was i just lived on that website on the literature page uh reading all the works of the early cypherpunks and what i found the most fascinating were the pre-bitcoin papers that were written on the topics of cryptographically uh, enabled money, as well as the early Satoshi Nakamoto writings after the release of Bitcoin, before Bitcoin actually got attention from the rest of the world. Those first one to one and a half years of early Satoshi writings, all of that you guys can find on the Nakamoto Institute. Michael Goldstein, thank you so much for joining us today at the Bitcoin Layer. 
The Bitcoin layer is sponsored by Voltage. Voltage is a provider of enterprise enterprise grade Bitcoin infrastructure. So if you guys need a node for your house or your business, go check out Voltage. Michael Goldstein, aka Bitstein, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you for having me. 